My name is Tom Delgado, and I want uh, beans and rice in my immigrant jam. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. The eclipse has brought out some powerful stuff. We are back at Immigrant Jam Le Headquarters. It's a special day here. We have a very special guest, comedian, actor, writer, YouTube superstar, um, sexiest man alive, 19 years in a row, uh, Tom Delgado. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you for the round of applause. Really appreciate it. Studio uh, audience. How's it going? Good to be here. Uh, wow. Very Thanks. slick. Um, yeah. Full disclosure, Tom and I have uh, found ourselves suddenly living in the same apartment. Uh, and sometimes it gets hot and heavy, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Tommy Two Time Delgado, um, That's right. That's you right. are the son of Nicaraguan immigrants. Yes. Who came here from Nicaragua? <laughs> That's right. That's because, where most Nicaraguan immigrants come from. That's uh, right. So yeah, my parents, my parents were married in Nicaragua. My dad came over. Uh, my mom and dad came over. My dad uh, bounced. They bounced around a little bit, uh, and then they stayed in Philadelphia for a little bit to for his training. And I was born in Philadelphia, Thomas mm. Jefferson Hospital. And the world was never the same. Yeah, it's a very big milestone for the history of mankind, <laughs> of person kind. <laughs> and your dad uh, came to the U.S. to become a doctor. So, yeah, my dad went to medical school in uh, in Nicaragua, and then he came over to, to the United States and uh, to, be, to do all his training and everything here. Right. And most of the first-generation people that I've had on the podcast so far have been people who uh, grew up in New York. Right. Or, yeah, a lot of people that have grown up in New York. You grew up in Tampa and being... Rub it in, why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I grew up in Tampa. It was, the it was trash an, capital of yeah. the world. Tell no. us about that dump. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, that's a totally different... I think uh, immigrant kids from New York, you know, have such a different experience growing up. Um, the kids of immigrants, because everybody's kind an of an immigrant, immigrant here. here. Yeah. Then people from other yes. places in the in the U.S., so I know that you've told me that when you were growing up, you were kind of embarrassed to be. Yeah, it's uh, it, it is. I guess that is true. Like in New York, you don't. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I guess New York's so great is you don't really feel that you don't feel like you're, you know, in the United States. You feel like you're just like in the world. Like everything is kind of the reflection of the world. There's different parts. There's different countries within the within the city and whatever. And and it's uh, in other places that's not the case. It's very segregated. It's very you know you you. Uh, so like yeah, you do feel you do feel kind of a dis different. Um, so you were embarrassed of your yeah, parents having an accent. Accent and like and I, I even like talk about it like on stage. So I was always embarrassed when my parents would speak Spanish to me in front of my friends, and uh, and like it would just I always felt like oh this is cool I'm hanging out I'm I'm blending in and then my parents would speak Spanish to me I'm like no you're giving me away I'm, I was just I was just talking about you know the Ninja Turtles and they were buying it and then uh, <laughs> and then eventually, and then eventually you know. They're like outed. Nicaraguans don't know about Ninja Turtles. Yeah, exactly. Turtles. What do you know about Ninja Turtles? Uh, so yeah, that's kind of that is kind of the, the, what ends up happening, I guess. Um, but I guess I look a little different than than what most people consider uh, Latin Americans to look like. So that that always, I guess. Which is another thing that I find really really yeah. interesting. Uh, you don't necessarily, as um, people say, present sure. Latino. I don't present. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't play right. Latino exactly right now. <laughs> no, but, and and yeah, yeah. and you've gotten shit. Like I remember, can you tell that audition story? Oh yeah, so I once went into an audition. So my full name is uh, Tomas Delgado without the H, you know, Tomas like my dad's name. And I went into an audition and uh, the lady, this is true, the lady asked me uh, what my full name was. I just normally go by Tom Delgado and I said my full name is Tomas Delgado and she was actually writing on a clipboard at the time. And when I said that, she turned over to me and looked me up and down literally and then goes, ugh, everybody's got to be different. And rolls her eyes and keeps writing. <laughs> and I was like, oh, all right, well, I guess, I uh, guess you don't buy it. That's fine. She, as if I just like made it. As it was like I was, you know, drawing hearts over the eyes in my name or something. Like I was trying to do something totally ridiculous. But uh, yeah, I guess, I guess she thought I was just putting on airs or whatever. So I was like, all right, well, Tom, it is. Because you grew up, you you did grow up like 
in in sort of an American way, like yeah, well, a, not necessarily. I mean, I, in my in an American school, but my my right. household was Nicaraguan. We spoke but Spanish. That's what I mean. You grew up in an American like setting, but at home, yeah. it was very Nicaraguan. You ate right. Nicaraguan food. Spoke Spanish. To this day, you yeah. cannot ingest anything that doesn't have rice, beans, and chicken in it. Their rice and beans is a very important part of the meal. You can eat it. <laughs> well, first of all, all thing, all joking aside, rice and beans are probably the most versatile versatile dish on the planet. You okay. can eat it any meal. You can eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You can eat it for a snack, but we don't need to get into that. I, you want to put it in your jam? Yeah, put it in a jam. Put it. I would. I would spread it on bread. Jam? I'd spread it on bread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd spread it on bread. Okay. Uh, anyways, yeah, we would eat. We would. Sp we spoke Spanish. My first language is Spanish. I learned Spanish first, uh, and we ate everything. Like all our friends in Tampa, believe it or not, were like Nicaraguan. All my parents' friends are Nicaraguan. There's like a little Nicaraguan community there. So yeah, it was like at home, it's this, and then out in the out in the world, it's something else. You know. So, and I went to a Catholic school, it was like a little private school, so it was all pretty much just regular, regular white kids, you know, <laughs> the regular, <laughs> not the Spanish white kids, but the, yeah. But that's got to be sort of, um, that's got to be sort of a conflict, right? Because on one hand, you have this identity where you're Nicaraguan and Latino and, and you live that um, very strongly at home and your parents have strong accents and you go there every year, or every other yeah, year, yeah. and you, you know, all the, all the people that you're surrounded with in your home life are um, Nicaraguan or Central American or Latinos. And then, then you're American. You were born in America. You, you also, as we we're just saying, look like an American I guess right now guy? I got the long hair and beard. I look kind of like a, Maybe you know, now, I look like a stereotype right now, but but I guess when my hair is short and my, I'm clean shaven, I do look like a regular, you know, Chad. So it's almost like Kevin. you have, <laughs> <laughs> no offense to Chad's. Yeah, no Kevin. Chad, no offense, you know. You Everybody's know I mean. gotta be all, different. It's all in okay. good fun, all right, relax. Um, No, but it's, it's but is that, that's gotta be kind of weird that, that it's like, it's almost like you have to um, justify your identity in a way. Is yeah. That well, there's like, I guess there's like a weird, it's a weird pressure you feel to kind of prove yourself. Right. Both ways. Right. Exactly. You know, like, I think like when we go to Nicaragua, I'm, I'm the gringo, you know, like yeah. I'm the, oh yeah, look at him. He's coming in. He's whatever. And, and then when I'm here, it's like, yeah, well, you're not totally whatever. You're all, you're still like, you know, that, you know, it's like, so you're kind of like, no, no, but I am. Look, I'm wearing uh, Doc Martens. I'm cool. Ah, you know, <laughs> I don't know if that was a good example, uh, Doc Martens. What year is it? Uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of a, yeah. you know, so, yeah. But, and do you think that's why you were so drawn to New York? Because you have this love for New York. You have your, well, your YouTube channel is all about, uh, New, mostly about New York. You became a New York tour guide yeah. as a, kind of a side gig, but also because you're passionate about the city and its yeah. history. Do you think that that, because there's so many people here that have this cr cross-cultural identity and here it's more normal to be from a lot of different places and yeah. have that than the other way around? Do you yeah. think that's I mean, I think so. I, I, to be honest, I came kind of New York as like an accident. It was kind of like a, it was kind of like a fluke. How there I, are no accidents. That's true. That's true. What is life? <laughs> What is reality? Uh, but no, it was it was kind of like a little. I went to I went I went to law school. I, I had a lot of friends there who came from up north, came from New York and everything. And a lot of them were coming back here. And it was between Florida and, and anywhere else. And Florida's deadline for the bar exam came up sooner. And I had, didn't have my stuff together. I didn't really want to go there. So I was like, screw it. I'm just going to go to New York with all you guys. So I, I basically just came here because it was easier. Okay, that's but fine. When but I you got could here, have left. Yes, you're right. Yeah. And when I got here, I kind of, that's just kind of like to, just to clarify, you know. But 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 when I got here, I did, I did kind of like fall in love with the city. And I did like that about it, that it does feel... Uh, I guess complete in a way. It, it feels like it kind of covers all the bases of the of the world, and it's got both sides of every issue. It's got everything. You know, it's 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 contradictions. It's it's messy. It's chaos, and I like that about it. And um, and yeah, I became a tour guide, and and I and I started studying the history of New York, which is kind of the history of the world for the last 400 years because everything has passed through here. You know, whether it's you know like whatever the the every the, fecal matter on Earth has passed through here. Every that's right, Lucy. That's right. Yeah. I also read. She reads lots of books. Books about yeah, can't can't get the the fecal books out of her hand. <laughs> yep. But yeah, and yeah. that's uh, and I think that's true, and I I guess that's one of like reasons I like studying New York history is because uh, like I said, everything kind of passes through New York in the last four hundred years. You're not really, not. and I think that's kind of cool. I don't know. 
guilty, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but you do like you you've lived in a neighborhood in New York and Queens that that has a lot of um Latin restaurants and Latin people and you do kind of look for that yeah, to I surround do. yourself with that because it does kind of make you feel Because I get beans home. and rice everywhere. <laughs> I can eat beans and rice. That's all that's, that's what I asked my broker. I'm like, "Hey, just give me the beans and rice neighborhoods." <laughs> He's like, don't worry, we got that folder over here. He like blows the dust off it. Here, here it is. Uh, but no, uh, yeah, I, I, um, I do like Queens. I mean, the most diverse place in the in the world, most linguistically diverse place in the world. Uh, you know, it's 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 an amazing place. I, I like it. I don't know. I feel like the New York experience. Everyone kind of likes to shit on New York and say that it's done. It's and it is to some in some places. Like it's gotten too expensive, and it is getting more expensive and everything. But I feel like that New York experience is still kind of alive and well, especially in places in Queens and whatever. You have the immigrants coming, the artists coming, everyone's striving and working and hustling to to make it up to something. And you know, and I think that's kind of cool. For now, it's still there, so that's good. But uh, but you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm drawn there. And and. Uh, so as a kid, you said you were embarrassed of your parents. Do you remember like a time where that changed, where you where you became proud of that, or where you you kind yeah. of uh, embraced it more? Well, I had a I, I have a joke in my I mean, it's not to do bits over here, but uh, in my in my set, I'll say you know the, I started embracing it when I when it came time to apply to college, <laughs> because right. like the world kind of tells you like oh it's good to be diverse. There's a thing and be and you're like huh maybe it is good and you start looking into it and you're like yeah yeah this is kind of cool. And you also encounter other people. Like growing up, I was surrounded by just regular, you know, everyone was just like a pretty much the same. Everyone's like a regular white kid and whatever. And you're just kind of like, oh, this is the world. But then when you see the world is a lot more than that, you're like, oh, oh, yeah, this is kind of cool. Yeah, this is really crazy. I've had this whole background, all this stuff. And, you know, I was embarrassed about speaking Spanish and all that. You realize how valuable that is. And, and yeah, I guess I guess when you kind of start leaving the house, when you start leaving your your nest you know, your your parent, you leave your parents behind. You go into the world, and you start kind of seeing that there's more out there. Uh, which for me, I guess, happened more in law school than it did in in college, because college was kind of an extension of high school. <laughs> <laughs> I went to I went to college where with a lot of friends from high school, and you know, and uh, you know, partied and did that whole thing. So it really wasn't a whole. Um, I didn't branch out as much as I could have. So in law school, you started to embrace this a little bit more. Yeah, you, I think so. Yourself yeah. More. yeah, yeah, and I started to kind of realize more who I who I was complete as a complete person and all the sides of myself and everything. And and yeah, I think so. Even though I hated law school, um, I, I enjoyed that part of it. And that's the next thing because as a son of immigrants that came here and like really, your dad's a brain surgeon. And, and, yeah, and that's, that's out of the bag. Yeah, <laughs> there it well, is. And that's that's a huge deal. Yeah, was for, a brain surgeon. He's retired. Was a brain yeah, surgeon, yeah. but that's a huge deal for someone to come from a country that's um, isn't Nicaragua. I think like the second poorest yeah, country second now poorest in the country Western in the, Hemisphere. Yeah, yeah. It's poor. Um, after Haiti, I think. Yeah. And that that's a huge deal for yeah. someone to come here and, with the language barrier and make make it here in that way. No, it is a huge deal, and my dad's never told me that ever. <laughs> no, but 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 that's exactly what I was gonna talk about. Yeah. And then you go to law school and you pass the bar yeah. and you start working as a lawyer, and then you realize you don't want to do this. That must have been a scary moment on so many different levels, not only because it's scary to say I'm going into showbiz, but also because of what that would mean well, in what, your family, yes. right? What you're saying is 100% like the, the first reaction everyone has is always, the. Fr I swear to you, 98% of the time when I tell people that I used to go to law school and what I do now, it's usually the next question out of their mouth is what do your parents think about it? Well, of course. And it's true, and it's fair. And I think what, what ends up happening, in, in my and case- And that's even if you don't know you have immigrant right, parents. Right, exactly. But with the immigrant parents- Even more so, yeah, even yeah. Even more course. so, yeah. Uh, yes, well, one, yeah, but I think, just to, I guess, clarify the, the route that I took, it wasn't like I woke up one day and quit my job. I was, for four years, I was you know taking classes, going to open mics, producing shows, you know, going to auditions, doing all that stuff at the same time as the job that I had. And it, and I built up a little bit of a career to where I could leave. And I did. I saved money and everything. And so it wasn't an overnight decision. My parents knew I was checking in with my parents and family and letting them know how much I hated life and that this was my one escape. And eventually I got to a point where I was like, all right, I can do it. And they're like, all right, go for it. You know, it seems like you were serious about it. So I did. Um, and so that is kind of like the, you know, that is kind of and and two, my parents have actually been kind of supportive. I joke around, I and I like make jokes about it and like said and stuff about how they, you know, 
like, you know, how it's like, it's embarrassing or whatever, but they have been kind of supportive in the sense that they just want me to be happy. They just want me to do what I want uh, mm -hmm. in a way, which is rare too, I guess. Uh, but they do put pressure, you know, and they have put pressure, especially up to now. I like, went to law school because of them and all this stuff too. So, um, yeah. It's interesting. I, I have. I also talk about this a little bit. That it's interesting. People always say that you, New York and the United States is like a city or a country of immigrants, but it's also like a country and a city of children of immigrants. Yeah, exactly. And those are two very different things. Mm -hmm. An immigrant comes to a new country and they bust their ass to survive, mm -hmm. you know, until just, I just need to eat. I need to provide for my family, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The kids of immigrants a lot of times bust their ass or freak out about busting their ass to please their parents, to, you and know, fulfill not, some kind of thing. Not that, only to please their parents, but also because to live up to the standard right, right, of right. what their parents gave up yes. or, or the hustle or the, you know, uh, the sacrifice yeah, that their parents made. And I think there was actually an interesting conversation. There's a woman who, who wrote a book about Asians and mental health, but she talks about how, you know, a lot of ki kids of immigrants don't allow themselves uh, to... Um, s s don't admit to their own suffering because they right. always feel like, well, it's nothing it's compared nothing. to what my parents yes. went through. And, I think and that's, that's kind of what you get instilled, mm -hmm. you know, even though I have parents who didn't come here and make it here, my right. parents continued working in Europe. My dad doesn't even speak English really, but still I have that feeling like because they sacrificed yeah. so much and they had to bust their ass yeah. so much and that's and that doesn't just go for your day-to-day -day, like logistics and difficulties of succeeding and all that it goes for your like your internal life right exactly. like you, you can't you you feel almost like this this inability to discuss your difficulties mentally and psychologically with the things you're dealing with because suck it up right you know exactly, like what yeah. are you talking about this is you, you, what what you know, I, you know, I, I came over from a war torn country and yep. whatever this, that, and the other, and you're like, oh, okay, sorry, I guess I shouldn't be sad. <laughs> My iPhone died. Yeah, exactly. And I'm, <laughs> I'm depressed. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get likes on TikTok. Yeah, exactly. I got a pimple. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that, it's, just, it's all you know. You get yeah. all these different uh, guilt trips, and you feel, and you you bottle things up, and you you know you resent you. Uh, yeah. It, it can be it can be a little bit uh, I guess taxing in that way. It's a, it's a but weird. that's what I mean also in, in respect to you quitting your job. Not only what your parents' reaction was, but what you internally, the pressure you internally put on yourself as yeah. the kid of someone who made you know yeah. such a life for themselves here and and who helped you go to law school yeah. obviously, and then what. Is that, you know, are you being ungrateful? Are you right. letting them down? Right. Whatever all that Well, is. that was part of the reason why I finished law school. I wasn't going to finish. Midway through law school, I was like, this sucks. I was, I wanted to just quit. And I was like, screw it, I'm going to finish. And, they, you know, I talked to them, and they were like, just do it. You know, you'll figure it out when you get out, and you have something to, to fall back on. I was like, all right. So I did, and it was a nightmare. I hated it, but I tried to make it my own. I studied abroad. I had a good time. Uh, and then I passed the bar, and I did that. That was like my last thing. And I was like, all right, I'm going to take a job. This will be my first and last legal job. And the reason I quit and what made it easier to quit was that I don't think I would be alive today if I'd stayed in law. I would have just, I would have run off a bridge. I would have, there was no way. I remember just being in that office and looking around at people and, and these people who were like in their mid forties and all that. I couldn't as, as my imagination, whatever, I couldn't with my imagination, imagine myself working in anything like that at that age. So it was either get out and find something else or I don't know where I was going to be. So, so I, it was really just not even a choice. I just had to do it. I had mm -hmm. to get out. But do you think that that also has to do with this kind of immigrant mentality of always um, finding your way? Because immigrants have to, like, for better or worse, find their way. That's right? true, yeah. And I, I know the conversations I've had with your dad, for example, about him starting to work in the hospital in Miami and how horrible it was for him there. And then, you know, figuring out yeah. where to go and where to be and, and where he could kind of uh, settle down and, mm -hmm. and be happy. I think that, that, and I've said this before on the podcast, that a lot of kids of immigrants have this like internal hustle and this sort of ability to adapt themselves and kind of like, but also find their way out, you know, because they, they grow up around people that have made impossible things possible, maybe. Yeah, you no, know? that's true. I guess that's true. I guess maybe uh, maybe it's something I take for granted, but you're right. Like Maybe there is this, this way of just kind of finding ways to make things work because I know that me, for example, when I was in law school, when I was just graduating law school, I didn't know how 
things were going to happen. Like I didn't go to school for any of the things that I wanted to do. I'd see people doing comedy or doing this. And I was like, how do you get there? Mm. But then you just kind of plug away day to day and you just kind of like slowly like find little, you know, cracks and crevices and sneak your way into stuff and meet people and kind of like catalog the right ways to do things and the right people to know whatever and you kind of find your way where you need to go. Do you remember your first open mic that you went to? I remember going to my first open mic to watch. It was at uh, Parkside Lounge which is still there. I used to run an open mic there for years and uh, real real good open mic guys. I ran that for too long actually. (laughs) That's actually a health hazard running an open mic. For those people that don't know what an open mic is it's a I guess it's an open microphone. Do people know? People know what an open mic is. An open mic is is just you go, you sign up, and you can go up and just, you know, say your thing for three or five minutes, whatever. And, and, uh, you know, it's like for comedy. Try to make people laugh. And it's all here in New York. Other cities, there'll be audience for these things. In New York, it's all comedians waiting for their turn to go up and try their jokes. And nobody laughs at it. And most people don't laugh. Um, So you went and watched. I went and watched. remember what you thought or felt? I remember being like, oh. I remember watching and being like, oh, this is comedy? I can do this. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, these guys suck. I can suck, too. You know, why not? So, so. It was kind of like a it was kind of eye opening in that regard. It's like this isn't there's nothing mysterious or mystical about this. And a lot of those people I remember seeing are now, you know, very successful comedians and everything. But I remember seeing and being like, oh, this isn't that this isn't like anything else. People suck at it. They work at it and they get better, you know, and and, uh, you start somewhere. and, And I remember going to the open mics and seeing all these like, you know, big comedians that are now big comedians at the first open mics I would go to and. And it was horrifying. And you just keep going and keep plugging away and you get more comfortable and whatever. And you also find, I think also too, one of the interesting things, how you're saying there's no accidents, how you're saying there's no, like it, once you follow something you want to be doing, it, it tends to lead you to other things mm-hmm. you might want to do. And that's what's end up happening. Like I started all of it with an improv class. And while I don't do improv anymore, and I, and it, I, I didn't care for it a whole lot, it led me to stand up, which led me to the acting stuff, which led me to like, you know, producing my own stuff and YouTube and everything too. So it's kind of interesting how that happens, you know. In fact, there's a very famous comedian called Tom Delgado in South America, right? No, his name's Tomas Delgado. Tomas Delgado. And he's Delgado. in Ecuador <laughs> and I have a joke about it. And the guy, he's a, he dresses in drag <laughs> and, uh, and he literally has like a catchphrase that's like, I, and he like looks in the camera and makes this like crazy. And there's also too, another, this is crazy. There's also a Tomas Delgado in, when you Google it, in Spain who ran over a five year old boy while driving his Audi and then sued the parents of the boy for the damage to his car. Hilarious. Yeah, that's the Tom that's Delgado what, yeah, story. That warrants <laughs> that warrants a I <laughs> But that's uh that's pretty much the joke. I was gonna say this yeah. is the big reveal. What's that? Uh it's you. That's right. I'm not only uh I'm a drag queen <laughs> and a murderer. Uh, I'm a murderer and a drag queen. It's a good combination. <laughs> yeah, of course. That seems like the two possible possibilities. That's those are two ultimate universes. For That's you. true. You're yeah, representing a guy getting somebody money for running someone of, or being a drag queen comedian. Like those are two extremes for That's your true. That's possible true. life outcomes. Everything, everywhere, all at once, yeah. featuring the story of the all the Tomas Delgados. That's right. All the possibilities for Tomas Delgado. That's right. And the Tom <laughs> Delgado who's in California and won't give me TomDelgado.com. <laughs> I got stuck with TomDelgado.net because of this guy. Oh, <laughs> nice Some real little estate plug investor. for the website there. This guy doesn't want to give it up. Uh, so look I'm going to be the, a second-rate website. Look at, the, look at the plug pro over here. No, plug pro, nothing. Just I, slipping I touched that him. right in. Uh, for those of you listening, TomDelgado.net, not Dot TomDelgado.com. Yeah, right. yeah I, okay? I, I, and you can check it out. I updated everything up to uh, 2019. So if you want to <laughs> see me four years ago, go check it out. Uh, but growing up, yeah. uh, you you said you grew up around a lot of people from Nicaragua, and you had like aunties and uncles that you went on vacation with, yeah. and all of that. Um, uh, I, yeah, those were the days. <laughs> no, but I, one of my favorite stories is the bingo story on oh, the cruise, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and the reason why. I love that story is because growing up, I also have so many stories where my parents would like yell things in German in restaurants and make us move five times and just be so embarrassing. I just wanted to die. And part of it was also the fact that they were immigrants yeah. and that they weren't speaking English and people were looking at us weird. Uh, but can you please tell us that? that yeah, story? I mean, you're right. Like, it's funny. Just certain things that, that you can growing up. That's what you do. Like I, I had, you know, I talk about it sometimes in stand up, like, like from your lunches right. that you the would lunch. get. 
delicious. Get, like oh I would God, get the lunch. Worst. Yeah, I, I, I thought everybody ate ham and butter sandwiches, <laughs> but no, apparently they don't. And they don't eat plantains. They eat Dunkaroos and stuff. And I was just growing yeah. up like, oh, this is just what everyone eats, you know. And I, the, the story you're talking about, we were on a cruise, uh, the big red boat. Uh, I don't know if it's still around, but they used to have like the Disney characters and everything. In fact, one of my uncles uh, got in a fight with uh, the Tweety Bird um, <laughs> because he wouldn't stay longer with our table, and he almost got thrown out. Uh, but the story you're talking about is um, is my aunt. Long story short, we went in for bingo. We would go into bingo every day. It was super fun. We had blasts. And my aunt was saving the cards. She was saving the cards because, like, yeah, you save them. You save ketchup packets. You save everything. Why not save bingo cards? So she saves the bingo cards, and we just kept reusing them. You're not supposed to do that. So uh, I had the, some of the cards. We each had cards in front of us, and one of my cards had bingo on it. And I knew it was one of those used, reused cards. So I was like, shit. I was like, I think I have bingo, guys. But I knew it was illegal. So I was like, this isn't good. This isn't good. But I said, I have bingo. And my aunt was like, bingo! <laughs> she goes crazy like, yeah! She starts jumping up and down with my card, and she's pointing at me. And they come over. They're like, all right, bingo! You know, like the cruise director comes over with like the <laughs> Hawaiian shirt. like, this is great. Hey, bingo! <laughs> they look down at my card. They're like, wait a minute. This isn't. You're reusing cards! And everyone starts booing us. And then they kick <laughs> us out of this place with like 300 people playing bingo. And so we basically make the walk of shame out of the bingo and we're banned for the rest of the trip. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, that was, my, that was be when my self-sabotage began. <laughs> Never again will I succeed at anything <laughs> to avoid being shamed. <laughs> Nicaraguan bingo, But that's baby. the story. Yeah, pretty crazy. Did you ever think about moving to Nicaragua after high school like uh, I'm asking that because when I was uh, when I was growing up we'd go to Germany every summer and it was so fun yeah. and I was like this is so cool you know and like it you got you were allowed to do more things than in the U.S. And you were and kind stuff. of treated like royalty. You're like, you're and coming you from cool, somewhere. Yeah, you exactly. Cool you would bring presents yeah. and people would put in orders yeah, yeah. for stuff they wanted from New York or the U.S. And then I was like, this is great. Yeah. It's, it's always going to be like this if I live here. Right. So I went and lived there and hated it. Did you ever consider I doing that? I thought about spending more time over there. I mean, we used to travel there every year. Uh, over the years, recently we haven't gone there because the political climate's a little dicey there. <laughs> it's a whole other podcast. But, uh, but yeah, we uh, we I used to want to go back because it's great, like it's super fun. I have like, a lot of my cousins and uncles are still there and everything and aunts. But uh, but yeah, I, it I never really materialized. I guess uh, I, was, I guess I was just busy with school and and law school and then coming to New York. And I think if I didn't live in New York, maybe I would have maybe I would have thought about it. But I don't know. I'm pretty pretty. I like it here. It's a good place. New York. Yeah. <laughs> pretty cool. So okay, then uh, you started doing tour guiding in New York because you love history. Yeah, well, yeah. And because and I, well, I another also, comedian. Yeah, actually, so it was more because I was running out of money. I left my job, I'd saved up a bunch of money in law, and then I left my job and I ran out of savings after like a year. I was like, oh, I could live off savings, and I just ran out of savings after a year, and it was either go back to something law-related or do something else, and another comedian who was doing tour, tour guiding at the time uh, suggested it to me, and uh, I did it. He walked me through all the, the tests, and I did it, and I just kind of loved it, because I've always loved to read, I've always loved history and everything, so it just kind of naturally fit. And, uh, and I just kept doing it for a few years and just really liked it. And then I had the idea of like, oh, maybe I should make some videos because this would be a cool TV show. This is something I would watch. I'd love to learn this history and have someone tell it to me in a way that's engaging and interesting and funny or whatever. So I just started making the videos and, uh, yeah, and made them like every few months, one every couple months. And, you know, and I, I tried to pitch it as a TV show. And uh, their response was, who the hell are you? <laughs> and why should we give you money? <laughs> Which is not surprising. Uh, so I just like, screw it. I'll just make it on my own. Made it on my own. Then the pandemic came. I, I said, screw it. I'm going to dive in. I just started making more and more often. I made it once a week. And it kind of started to take off over pandemic. And now I make a living off that. Which is cool. But also, you're also passionate about showing you know, small businesses yes. in New York and showing sort of the side of New York. Because there's a lot of YouTube people making videos about New York, but your videos aren't like that and and your videos aren't and also they're also not just new york no they're right? not just yeah. new york i've been a camera person yeah, lucy is my sometime camera person panama and puerto rico yeah. and all the best to videos Mexico. Yeah. tulum and arthur avenue and arthur also avenue, yeah. outside of new york city right. you gotta take an airplane uh no but because your videos aren't just this like five best places to go or you know these like top seven things you shouldn't do in right, new york exactly how i got scammed yeah. on times square as you can see in under <laughs> one hour yeah. Yeah, yeah um so you're passionate also about uh that side of it and sort of uh 
the gentrification and kind of helping to keep the old New York or what makes New York, New York alive in a way. Cause that's yeah. kind of what you do in your videos. Well, you're, yeah. You know, you're documenting places to, yeah. that may disappear and people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, I, I think that's very important. Them <laughs> we erase them. <laughs> no, no. I just try to, I just try to, I think that's important. I think with, especially now with so many people moving to the city, especially young people, uh, the, the frame of reference of what, I mean, look, I'm not trying to make it like I've been here for a hundred years either, but I think you start seeing it kind of slide and the sand, like going through your fingers, you know, and you, well, you just want to convey to people what it is it's about, what the city's supposed to be about, what a city period is supposed to be about. And the only way to do that is kind of telling stories and, and showing people and places and, and history. What is and, a city supposed to be about? Well, I think, I think a city is supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be messy. It's supposed to be kind of chaotic in a way. And I, I don't mean messy like physically. I mean messy. Every German person who's listening yeah. just got an, a pain in their But when I say messy, butthole. I don't mean like dirty. <laughs> I don't mean dirty. I mean it's supposed to be a mix. It's supposed to be like this, uh, you know, quote, melting pot, you know, and that can be chaotic because you have different types of people. You have different, you know, whatever, backgrounds, all this stuff all in one place. But it also has to be organic. You know, and I think one of the problems that's happening now, not to get off in another podcast that we might have, is, is it's kind of being slowly curated. Like it, the city's being curated by specific powers that be, whether it's developers, city politics, whatever, uh, to kind of cater to a certain clientele uh, to the detriment of a whole group of people that also make the city interesting and special. And I think that's the biggest problem. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think that's one of the that's one of the big issues. But um, but yeah, yeah, I just try to tell those stories, meet those people and stuff like that. You know, I think it's kind of, you know, my little my little two cents, you know, my little uh, labor of love or whatever you call it. Well, that's not true. You you have a huge following and uh, people recognize yeah. you on the street all the time and true. and love your videos. And I think, um, yeah, you especially even for people that grew up, I grew up in New York and there's so much stuff in your videos that I don't know about. Or even if I do know about it, it's exciting to see, you know, someone show that side of New York that isn't all about these like clickbaity, right. you know, places, places or brunch. And those are fine yeah, too, fine. whatever. Part of New but, York, sure. but, but New York has always been so, the, the thing that always made New York special, I think, was the, the grit and also, as you say, like kind of the anarchy of the place. Yeah. You know, that it feels kind of like the Wild West right. and that it's not clean and it not, you know, sort of like um, predictable. Right. And that's the thing. I, and I just want to clarify, I don't mean because a lot of times people jump on someone and say, oh, what do you want it to be like dangerous and get mugged <laughs> and graffiti everywhere? And no one's advocating for that. No right. one. Uh, I think what ends up happening is you clean the place up and you sweep certain problems under the rug to do that. And so when you end up cleaning it up, when you end up doing these things, it's for a certain clientele you're 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 only really catering to a certain type of person and and it's about including everybody and it's about keeping the city complete and comp and open that it closes the city off when it becomes so expensive when it becomes less accessible when there aren't any you know any safety nets or all that stuff all that stuff it creates problems and the city suffers for that i mean you can walk through some of the fanciest neighborhoods in the city and you can see exactly what i'm talking about i mean some of the most expensive neighborhoods in the city are the worst ones to be in you know because they're empty they're dead at night they're you know they're and they're soulless, you know? So I think that, uh, you know, just to clarify, you know, I don't wanna. Yeah, I got mugged in Soho after it started getting nice. Yeah, I know a couple people who have. I yeah. grew up there in the 90s and it was supposedly, you know, not as nice. And then I got mugged in 2001. Yeah, well, people are getting mugged when there now. Was, like yeah. in the last couple of years, people are getting mugged there. Right getting, now. Yeah, yeah, right now. No, we're sending someone yeah. to mug yeah. someone right now. We're in Soho <laughs> and, and Mike is mugging someone as we film this right now. <laughs> um, do you feel like, because I've seen, just to come back to that, to, to your, like, the fact that you don't necessarily look Latino. I've seen, I've walked into stores with you in New York and you uh, speak Spanish to the people working there and they do like a double take. Yeah. Or they, they address you in English and then you speak Spanish. Right. And I know your lady at the laundromat like had a laughing fit, right? Yeah. When, when you walked in. And, yeah, she and started laughing that I, that I spoke Spanish and uh, I was just shocked, I guess. But I, you know, I guess, we're all guilty of our prejudices. People think I don't look, you know, especially when I when I have short hair and, and clean shaven and stuff. But uh, but does that bother you? Do you nah, care? I mean, not really, I guess. I mean, it, it, it bothers me when people kind of deny you something based on it. When people kind of 
you know, like I said, like the, the casting director type thing, like that kind of stuff is annoying. It's really, it's not that it's just as annoying. It, it messes with your head too. You know, who are you as you grow up? If people, if one side thinks of you that way and the other side thinks of you as, you know, what, what the hell are you? So what do you think you are? Do you, if someone asks you, where are you from? Do you say I'm American? Yeah, I mean, I, I identify with being American, I for sure. But I think also, too, to be American isn't just to be American. Like, that's one of the beauties of this country. And I think if we embrace it more as a country, we'd be better off for it. To, the, the thing that makes this country special is to be American doesn't really mean the same thing it means in other countries that have been around for longer, that have deeper ethnic roots or whatever. And to be American means you are pretty much an immigrant or a kid of immigrants or a descendant of immigrants. And I think if we embrace that a little more, we'd be we'd be better off for it because that's what makes this place special. And that's what built this country. I mean, the reason that this country is is only been around for 400 years and, you know, countries that have been around since the Roman Empire look up to the United States is because people from all over the world came here. They hustled their ass off. They built bridges and skyscrapers and businesses. And it took off because all the biggest brains and the biggest, you know, egos and ambitions from all around the world came to one place and just started, you know, butting heads, collaborating, fighting, whatever. But the result is, you know, New York. The result is the United States. And I think if we can just own that, I think we'd be better off for it, you know. That's true, but at the Sorry, same time. I'm going to start tearing up. Uh, you know? <laughs> vote for Tom yeah, Delgado exactly. in the That's primary. That's why my five-point plan is exactly what's going to get <laughs> Ridgewood uh, <laughs> back. Um, I, that's true, but at the same time, I do think that, you know, someone who's like fourth, generation sure, sure, american sure. Yes. there is a, a different sort of yeah. sensibility towards things i think that you 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 I, I know you very well obviously but you have very american sides to you and then you have something that i think you can only really understand as a kid of immigrants sure. that goes you know in a, in a yeah. different direction about this like cross-cultural upbringing or even mike who, who's your second generation, right? Yeah, I think is closer to that. And uh, so I do think there's a bit of a difference in yes. the, the sensibility of like how you view the world yes. maybe or people when you're like further removed than that. And, and you know, your people no, have you're always right. been in this country or even have not lived in a diverse place. You're 100% you know? right. And I think that goes to what I was saying before. If we just embraced and, and connected with those sides of right. ourselves, it might help a little bit. But you're right. Like there are, there, but that, that goes back to, you know, even like the 1800s when like, you know, the mid 1800s or whatever, when the Irish were coming in, you know, you had the nativists, the people who were born here were getting mad at these Irish and they'd only been here for one or two generations. The country hadn't even been around for that long, you know? Yeah. And like it, Italian, Amer Italians yeah, were, were... The Italians came after the Irish and the Irish were getting mad at the Italians, yeah. you know, like it's the same thing. I mean, it, it, it happens, you know, it, history repeats itself, I think. And uh, and yeah, you're right, you're right. There is, but I think that's also too, uh, a, 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 what ends up happening here is because we were talking about like you see people come and they suffer and they fight and they, they have to sacrifice and everything. I think once they do that, they feel a sense of ownership. And I think that the, the subsequent generations kind of buy into that. You know, you, it's funny because I want to tell. So, for example, there's a big conservative group. There's a lot of conservative immigrants, too. And people are always surprised when they hear that yeah. they're conservative immigrants who are you who want more immigration controls and all that stuff. They're surprised to hear that. But you won't find more conservative people than immigrants who've come to a new country mm -hmm. and succeeded there. Yeah. Because they are the exception and they feel that way and they, they think I did it. Right. So you do it. Don't take my money away from me. Don't you right. pick yourself up by your bootstraps or whatever and do it yourself. And so it's interesting. It's interesting how that happens. Or if know? I can come here legally, yeah, why you, can't you? And not even just illegally. Yeah. Some of them come in illegally, but they say I succeeded and right. I'm paying my taxes now and I'm doing this and that and the other. So you do it. You know, I'm not and I'm not going to just open up for you and open my wallet up for you or whatever. So. It's kind of that's kind of an interesting conundrum too, I guess sometimes. But it is interesting. It's interesting. They they were talking about this um, replacement theory, sure. right? And and um, as part of it, Ooh. the the big belief. Well, <laughs> the, the big turn of the no, podcast. but the big belief there is that that uh, you know a lot of people that yeah, believe yeah. in this believe that immigrants are that Democrats yeah. are bringing in immigrants to vote. Democratic because right. immigrants vote Democratic 100% of the time right. and and you're so yeah. right it's so not true I remember my my grandma's family who came here from Romania uh, you know Jewish after fascism and and then the communists there and 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 who were jailed by the communists there and then came to America and so left their country and sort of were the type of immigrants who had been treated so badly in their country that they like denounced right. the country and were more conservative than anybody I'd ever 
known, yeah. especially when it came to immigration laws, mm -hmm. you know, and really had like uh, contempt for for immigrants or even, you know, refugees and illegal immigrants. And it was like kind of exactly that thing. If we can do it, yeah, um, you should do it too. You should do it too. And and sort of an anger towards also uh, the 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 way that their their places of birth are like mismanaged right. and how people behave there and yeah. why can't you just you know and also too the interesting thing about that is the embrace of the identity the new identity exactly it's like they're no longer nicaraguan they're no longer mexican they're no longer whatever they're they're americans now exactly. it's like i'm a citizen now I'm, this is my country like you stay out you know like it's crazy right. like you've embraced it you only you've been here for l less than a majority of your life but you've embraced the identity and you're guarding it and, you're and you have an it. accent you have an and accent yeah, and, yeah. and a lot of people in the country would say you're not even that they would look at you and be like get the hell out of my country you know but you still think like no this is me and that's fine and that's great but i just think it's interesting how, how it's done to the exclusion of other people uh mm -hmm. who basically are trying to do the same thing you are you know uh so that's kind of that's kind of interesting i guess um well, uh, Tommy, two-time Delgado. What? 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 Is that it? That's it. Get out of here. Go. Wow. <laughs> no, do, we... Do you end um... all your podcasts with the replacement <laughs> theory discussion? <laughs> no, I, I just think that it might be time uh, for the poll questionnaire. The poll questionnaire. Let's do it. What do you think, Mike? I think it's just, just for the poll. Uh, yeah. All oh, right, you woke so... him up, man. Why'd you do that? <laughs> <laughs> he was taking a nice nap. You had to wake him up. Um... Tom Delgado, right. uh, every every week we do something that we call the poll questionnaire. Uh, first thing that comes to mind, uh, very important questions. Are you ready? Sure. I'm okay. ready. In a movie about the Statue of Liberty, who would you cast as the Statue of Liberty? Um, uh, Betty White. Oh, she's, she's dead. dead. <laughs> which is why I would cast her. <laughs> Get to nice. work, lady. <laughs> You've been sleeping long enough. I don't know. Uh, I guess who would be a good... Uh, are we looking for, like, look? Or are you looking for, like, the story? No, it's up to you. It's your movie. That's tough. That's a tough question. I think Betty White is a good answer. Yeah, Betty White, you know, she's a sweet old lady. <laughs> I guess uh, I guess the uh, I guess Statue of Liberty isn't that old. Uh, or very old. Or very old, that's true. Um, they say the, the Statue of Liberty is modeled after the mom of the sculptor. The mom yeah, of the I sculptor? That, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. yeah. Wow. But yeah, uh, the face, I, I believe. Um, not the boobs. That would be no, weird. not the boobs. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think, I, I don't know. That's a that's a good question. Meryl Streep, I don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, she's a good actress. I don't know. Is it, uh, okay, she gets all the good parts. Yeah, I guess you're right. Maybe let's let's, let's leave her out of it. She's she's a Hollywood <laughs> elite. She's the she's the <laughs> she's the Hollywood elite. Let's get her out of there. I don't know. I you know what I'd do? I'd cast uh, a struggling uh, NYU student or something. Or, uh, or no, better better. You know what? Struggling not a struggling NYU, NYU student, student. A struggling public. A struggling uni University of Florida student. How about that? Ooh. Struggling University of Florida theater student. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> your, here's your part, uh, the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> okay. Um, if you could add one face to Mount Rushmore, whose face you, would you has add? Has to be a president? No. Uh, well, it could be anybody? Yeah, of course. It could be anybody. So you just put, like, you know, Brian Cranston on, like, the <laughs> mat next to all the... I mean, if that's who you I want. I don't know. That's the first thing that came to my mind. I don't know. It's kind of weird. But, no, uh, that is weird. Yeah, it's very Maybe weird. Maybe we should unpack that. Yeah, I don't know. I never, I never really watched. Uh, I never really watched that show. Breaking I watched. Bad. Yeah, I watched the first season. I was like, "This is what all the hype's about." It was pretty good, but it wasn't that great. Um, so you just add a random guy there, basically. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd add. Uh, you know, I'd add. Um, God, that's a tough question. These are hard questions. I know. Um, I think we we're gonna go with Brian Cranston. No, no, no. Don't. I don't want. <laughs> I don't want to be quoted as putting Brian Cranston up there. Um, I don't know. I guess uh, you know maybe. Uh, <sighs> That's tough. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Wow. It's president. You got to put a president up there. It'd I be, don't think so. It's weird to put a. You guys can put like a janitor up with a president. It's presidents. a made up scenario. That's true. <laughs> this is a lot of pressure. This is. It's not real. Someone could re research when they're actually looking to put a new face, <laughs> and they're like, "Where can we find this?" And they Google questions, and they find this. I mean, I know my answer. What's yours? Tom. Delgado. Oh, well, then maybe I should just go with that. I'll put myself. <laughs> Who would you put on Mount Rushmore? Myself, actually, <laughs> naturally. 
I put uh, myself. If you could add one amendment to the Constitution, what would you add? Mm, well, you know, it's actually uh, <sighs> there. I think uh, there's actually a movement. There was a movement that kind of that's kind of fallen the, into the uh, into the background with everything that's been going on in the last handful of years. But I, I think there needs to be a, a constitutional amendment uh, addressing corporations and the power of corporations and the the uh, the consideration of corporations as people. I thought you were going to say like there was a movement like the Slinky movement. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a Slinky movement. Um, okay, Betty so White addressing corporations. Yeah, no, there's a there's a movement. Uh, there was a movement called uh, I forget what it was. I was I was um, moved to amend was the group that I was I used to kind of volunteer with, and they were moving to add an amendment to the Constitution that addressed the personhood of corporations. Um, because that's kind of what's allowed corporations to get as much power as they have. And it, and it, and it, as much as we know them as a everyday part of life, uh, you know, back in like the 1800s, that wasn't the case. Like it, well, corporations were very much for function. You started one to build a bridge, to do this, and then it was done. You, it wasn't supposed to go into infinity and become this wealth and just basically an entity in itself. You know, this, this person who could basically do everything except die. And, and it just amasses wealth, amasses power, and it basically starts to dictate what we do every day. And so I, there was a movement, and it still is there, it's called, it was moved to men, one of the, one of the groups, and I was, used to volunteer for it, that was moving to put an amendment in the Constitution that kind of reined that in and took that away. But now they all work for Amazon. R or right. Jeff right. Bezos. <laughs> Amazon actually. <laughs> they were all recruited. All the volunteers were recruited and by they were, big they, corporations. Yeah, they were shot into space. <laughs> they, were, they were all shot into they're space. They're all floating there yeah, going, ah, yeah. corporations. They're screaming into the void, silently screaming. But no, yeah, that would be the one, I think. Okay. That's Not to get too serious. And we go from Betty White to abolishing corporate personhood. No, but, that's good. Uh, but I think that's, that's what Betty important. White would have wanted. Maybe, maybe that or hosting SNL again. That's one of those two <laughs> things I would want. But, um, but yeah, I think that would be a good one, good one to start. At least having the conversation, I think. Okay. Yeah. What's the most Nicaraguan thing you've ever done? Uh oh. Ah, that's a that's a good question. What's the most Nicaraguan thing I've ever done? Well, aside from getting kicked out of a a, a cruise bingo game <laughs> for cheating. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I guess growing up, I guess we used to, we used to do all kinds of stuff. We used to like, uh, I used to have a little slingshot and I'd ride in the back of pickup trucks and shoot little rocks outside. I, I remember once we, um, we, we used to, uh, I don't know, this is, this is probably going to get one of the, it's weird. I always remember like we used to, we used to have a rabid dog in the neighborhood in, in, uh, in Nicaragua who would come around and we'd mess with that. We dug up a, a cat that we had buried a few weeks before. <laughs> We thought that was kind of cool. Like when you're in Nicaragua, you do some random stuff as a kid. Um, but uh, so you dug it up and then you and we wanted to see what it looked like. After and then us. you um, buried it again. Yeah, we buried it again. Okay, yeah, it's pretty cool, right? What did it look like? Uh, it was covered in maggots. Nice. Yeah, it's covered in maggots. Um, Mike, you have you, Mike maggots? does cooking shows. You know, that's, <laughs> some, that's something that you can consider for next time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, I don't know. I, I, that's a hard question, I guess. We. I always, when I, where I think of being in Nicaragua as a kid, I think of riding in the back of pickup trucks. That's mm -hmm. all we ever did. Like me and like 10 cousins, we would just ride in the back. We'd stuff ourselves in the back of pickup trucks. And we just thought that's how everyone got from place, one place to the other. <laughs> so I just, to me, that, that, uh, that, that always reminds me of being in Nicaragua. What's the most American thing you've ever done? Most American thing I've ever done? Uh, uh, besides this J crew outfit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Most American thing I've ever done. Um, I don't know. I guess. I guess. Being a fraternity. I was in a fraternity in college. That's, that's so pretty American. American. Yeah. That for me. Yeah. That's like the ultimately American yeah. thing. Yeah. That's, that's like stuff a, as as someone that's not American that you see in movies and you're yeah. like, this isn't real, I know, is it? I know. And it's a weird thing. Like, I guess I look back at my life and it's all these different like phases that I have. Like some people, they're like, I've always wanted to be blank my whole life. And they just work at that. Their oh, whole I thought you said black. No, no. I've always wanted to be <laughs> black. Yeah. yeah. Different podcast again. Uh, no, this is this. <laughs> this is a uh, 
this is a, I guess people always have like, I've always wanted to be blank. You know, they've always right. wanted to be this or that. And their whole life is just a trajectory and all the variety of experiences based on that trajectory. But for me, it's always been these weird, like I've had like just phases in my life, you know, different identities, almost. I complete identities. And I feel like maybe that's just cause I'm a Gemini. I don't know. I'm not a big astrology guy, but I, I guess, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Is that, is that bad? Astrology is real, everyone. <laughs> We're all slaves to astrology. No, but I don't know. I guess I guess that uh, that was one of my identities when I went when I like I said when I went to law, uh, college. I just followed like my, a lot of my friends from high school, and they all did it. So I was like, ah, screw it, I'll do it. And it was fine. It was like you know, it was a little bit. Uh, but did you do the like upside down uh, beer um, uh, hose, whatever that's called? The old upside down beer hose. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy knows her stuff. Nothing gets by her. Yeah, if I had a nickel for every time someone's asked me about the upside down beer hose, man, I'd be a rich man. Um, no, I didn't do the upside down beer hose. But, <laughs> but you're talking about keg stands. Yes. Yeah, I did keg stands. Yeah, I did keg stands. <laughs> yeah, I did. Keg, I did I, I've been known to do a keg stand or two uh, back in the day. What, how, what What does that entail exactly? Well, all a keg stand is. Yeah, this is this is a good clip. This is clip worthy stuff right here. <laughs> Tom Delgado on the podcast explained what a keg stand is. <laughs> We're doing real art here. No, a keg, a keg stand is when someone holds your feet up and you basically drink out of the actual keg uh, for as long as you can. Hose. The keg, yeah, the, the keg. Hose the hose of the keg. I guess it's we call hose. it a hose. It's yeah, a sure. beer keg. Oh, I think a hose, I think of like, <laughs> <laughs> like a freaking fire hose. How do they hold your feet upside down? Two people uh, hold you up and oh, you're, okay. you're, you're holding on to the keg. Right. So and you're then, upside down. Yeah, yeah. So you're, up, right. you're upside down. Yeah, you're upside down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you, you did the scientific name, the <laughs> upside down beer hose challenge. <laughs> But yeah, it's uh, just a keg stand. That's what it's internationally known as. That's what it's known as in the DSM, the the psychology ma oh, manual. Right. Um, yeah. So you do you did that? Uh, yeah, I did it every now and then. I would do one. I've been known to do one or two. You know, guilty. You know, it was a, it was a, long, it was a long time ago. <laughs> did you ever pass out on a train in Chicago on your way home from a well Aerosmith well, concert? No, it wasn't Aerosmith. No, well, I my know. first concert ever, the first time I ever got drunk, uh, was was uh, a Jimmy Buffett concert. <laughs> in chicago and uh yeah and i and i got you can sick. take the boy out of florida but you can't take the floor no, i can't boy. jimmy buffett jimmy buffett uh is a way of life in florida believe it or not and I mean, it's one of the like my earliest memories of hearing his music or as he's internationally known as jimmy buffet no 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 he's french no jimmy no, 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 no 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 he's uh he's jimmy buffett you know and uh and yeah and in, in, in um in chicago that was my first concert ever was a jimmy buffett well my first real concert ever was a jimmy buffett concert and i uh i got sick on the chicago mass transit <laughs> you know sorry whoever had to clean that up uh but uh yeah it's a great concert and weren't you also um on no, Xanax no, no, at no. a right. Boys never, to Men I don't concert? Do, I don't do anything like that. I don't do stuff like that ever. Uh, no, I mean, uh, in, you know, in high school you do some stuff and, uh, you know, you do some... Well, was it Boys to Men? Well, one time in, 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 uh, in, in high school I got, I got, uh, I got really, I got really uh, inebriated and, <laughs> uh, and I, I don't remember anything. And uh, it was a, I think it was Blackstreet concert. Right. You guys remember in Black Street, all yeah. you Gen Zers, you know, you're missing out. No diggity is what uh, what they sang, and uh, along with some other stuff. But uh, I went missing. My friends got all scared, and uh, they they recruited a police officer to look for me for 45 minutes, and they found me eventually. And I was standing next to a concrete pillar in the arena, facing it, popping and locking by myself. <laughs> Uh, just a little aside, I don't know how to pop and lock, you know, but I, I gave it a shot. I gave it a shot and I don't remember any of it, but, uh, yeah, that was the story. Uh, okay, great. Yeah. Um, if you were president of the United States of America, what food would you ban? What food would I ban? Yeah. What American food would you ban? Oh, wow. What food would I ban? I don't know. I, as much as I hate vegetables, I don't think it would be good to ban vegetables. I think it would be still important that they be around. I hate them. I don't like them. Yeah, Tom I, doesn't eat vegetables. I don't really eat vegetables. I think. And uh, unfortunately, his dad, who was a brain surgeon, yeah. also doesn't eat vegetables. Yeah, I had doctor's orders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, doctor's orders, don't eat vegetables. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Um, what food would I ban? I don't know. I guess um, I'm trying to think of what, what food I hate the most. But uh, Another interesting thing is that you had never eaten a real raspberry until you met me. Uh, yeah, yeah. That was a turning point in my life. Um, <laughs> I met Lucy and ate raspberries. No, I also didn't eat cheese till college. 
I didn't eat. That's I never eaten cheese till college. You've, you've never, I'd eaten never eaten cheese. I never eat really cheese other on pizza, but I never really oh, eaten well, like cheese. cheese. Yeah, but like you know, that's not the same. Pizza's pizza. But that's cheese. No, it's pizza. That's bread with cheese. That's nah, pizza. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different like it's a di- it, on like the pe- uh, element the period the periodic <laughs> table of elements. It's different. Pizza's okay. different from cheese. All right. Um, but yeah. So I, what food would you ban? What if you food were would I ban if I was president? I would ban. Um, uh, What's a harmful food? I mean, what's like a harm? What, no, what, what food, food do you hate? I mean, you hate mayonnaise. Yeah, I do hate mayonnaise. And condiments. It's pretty disgusting. Mayonnaise is pretty disgusting. I'm not a big fan of condiments. Um, yeah, I guess I guess maybe mayonnaise. I'm not a big fan of mayonnaise. Um, but I don't know. I don't. I guess I don't have that much hate in my heart for food, for any food <laughs> at all. I, okay. Other than vegetables, I'm not a big fan of vegetables. But I do. I don't think I should ban them. All right. you know? okay. I think it should be a big Very smorgasbord. Diplomatic. A smorgasbord of <laughs> smorgasbord. Smorgasbord? No, I spent smorgasbord like the. Anyway, smorgasbord. Borg. Borg. Berg? No, smorgasbord is the thing in Wisburg. Yeah, smorgasbord. No, isn't isn't it a cookie with marshmallows in it? Isn't no, that you're a smorgasbord? Of s'more. Oh, right. <laughs> s'more isn't short for smorgasbord. <laughs> no, 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 smorgasbord. <laughs> yeah, well, we're learning stuff today. Yeah, I learned S'more so is much not on this short podcast. for smorgasbord. And I also um, expose how many things I don't know. Listen, we the first thing we all got to do is admit we don't know anything, right? Exactly. That's the first what step. do we know? Nothing. nothing. We know nothing. nothing. And the more you learn, the more you realize you know nothing. Exactly. Um, if you could deport one American person, who would you deport? Mm. Uh, I would say, I don't know, maybe Jeff Bezos or something. I don't know. Although I don't think it really do anything. I think, uh, you know, it would probably just, you know, ruin us all from a different country. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're not watching this, Jeff. Oh. <laughs> so Jeff Bezos, final answer? I, I guess, yeah, sure, Jeff Bezos. I don't know. Something about him doesn't sit right with me. I have my suspicions that he's out for the world. <laughs> to conquer the world. <laughs> okay, uh, and then lastly, most important question of all time, Tom Tommy two-time Delgado, do you know how I can meet David Hasselhoff? Uh, yeah. I mean, you had that. Uh, you had an audition recently, that audition like a little bit ago. Yeah. Lucy is very humble, but she had an audition to be. be what is there not? What is there to brag about? That's well, nothing to were, brag about. Were, I had an audition I didn't get to it. To play his like love interest in, a, in something. Yeah. And, 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 and that, I, you didn't get it. Didn't but get but it. I think, hey. <laughs> very humble. Lucy's so humble about her failures. Really. She doesn't talk about all her it's failures. It's really, really. It's real but humility. I would say, <laughs> hey, you keep at it. You keep at it and you'll get there. <laughs> you'll, get, you'll get there. No, I think there are, as we said earlier, there are no accidents. And I think that it would have actually been a detriment to have gotten that part and to have met him. Sure. That way. Right. Sure. Because I yeah. would have had to make out with him. That's true. That's true. And, you, and, and then you would have gotten herpes, yeah. And then I would have gotten herpes and, and you would have gotten herpes. And I would have, yeah, I would have died of herpes. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I saved your life Thank you. by not get, getting that part. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're yeah. welcome. Um, Tommy Delgado, Tom Delgado, uh, people can find you on YouTube. Yeah, so there's this website called YouTube.com. I have a channel, they call them there. Uh, it's Tom DNYC. And then on Instagram at Tom DNYC. And that's pretty much it. Don't really do the Twitter, barely do the Instagram, but I do the, but do it and follow it anyway. That's where I post everything. And then also YouTube and that's it. Yeah, really, you guys listening have to check out Tom's YouTube channel, um, not only because I have done some of the camera work for some Very of the videos. Very good camera work. Uh, the channel is amazing. The videos are funny, and you learn so much, and they're unique, and there's nothing like that on YouTube. Um, I think that, as Tom said earlier, you know, all history kind of – connects and intertwines here in New York. And it's just fascinating. The uh, places he covers, the stories he covers, uh, the the things you learn and how funny and fun they are at the same time. So go check them out. Yeah, check you it will out. And not also be too, sorry. I like the fact that it, I try to cover New York, but I try to cover other places as well. But I think the cool thing about the New York history is that it's kind of a microcosm for the United States history. Right. And it's kind of a micro, which is for then the a co- world. for the yeah. world. Exactly. So it goes to, and I think, you know, that because New York is such a quote, you know, 
complete city in that regard with people from all over and all this stuff like it really kind of represents the world and and uh, to learn about new york's history and and what makes new york tick is to learn about what makes the rest of the world tick which is kind of cool wow look at that vote yeah. tom delgado vote for me. Uh, um, check out his youtube follow him on instagram thank you so much for thank being you so on much. immigrant jam Lucy. the podcast it's my honor immigrant jam i you and know thank you for buying toilet paper today I toilet paper uh, i bought a chain for, i bought a chain for a hanging plant that we've been trying to put up plant. so you know hanging plant. Busy we just day today. moved into a new place yeah. we have a balcony it's yeah. amazing i'm a really busy day um thank so, yeah. you thank you thank you everybody please i'll rate review like like and subscribe. Thank you to Mike Albany. Mike Albany is the best. The best. We MVP, woke him up again. MVP. Um, yeah. yeah. Rate and review it. Rate and review it. Rate That's and review big. it. It takes two seconds. That's huge. It takes exactly two seconds. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. We love you. Uh, Peace, no love, and hair grease. If you liked what you just heard, don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, recommend to all your friends, and if you hated it, recommend it to your enemies. Thank you for listening to Immigrant Jam, the podcast with me, Lucy Pohl. Have a delicious and nutritious day.